This week on Christian World News, as Christians around the globe celebrate the coming of the Savior, we'll tell you why you can still trust the Christmas story. Plus, the bomb of Gilead. Did the Magi offer this valuable gift to the Holy Family? And why is this ancient crop making a comeback today? And the lost story from Charles Dickens, how it sheds new light on the author's own life and faith. Welcome to this special Christmas edition of Christian World News. I'm Wendy Griffith. Well, Christians worldwide are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us He was born of a virgin, fulfilling biblical prophecies about the Messiah. But in a growing secular society, more and more Americans deny such miracles and question the accuracy of the Bible. Paul Strand talked to three experts with evidence that the believers, rather than the scoffers, are right. These days, many Christians, especially college-age students, find their faith in God and the Bible questioned, if not downright assaulted. Sometimes they'll have a professor that's going to outright challenge why they believe what they believe and say, look, what you believe is actually a fairy tale. Not so, according to three of the world's top biblical experts, who told CBN News there's good reason to have faith in your faith. The faith is very, very defendable. That's why it's lasted for 2,000 years. They point to how even respected non-believers wrote about Jesus. Sixteen total historians apart from the scripture or anything else that reference Christ. Almost everything about Christ we can find out without ever going to the New Testament. The fact is surviving manuscripts we have for almost any ancient writings were produced hundreds of years after those original writings. Jonathan Morrow tells students at the Impact 360 Institute there's more evidence that Jesus lived than Julius Caesar, yet no one doubts Caesar existed. Also, a rule is the closer in time the writer was to events, the more likely his account is accurate. Peter, John, and James lived with Jesus. John said, what our eyes have seen, what our ears have heard, what our hands have handled is what we're declaring unto you. In other words, we were eyewitnesses. We were there. And Morrow points out Paul and Luke interviewed them and knew many others who witnessed Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. When you're doing history, you want early and you want eyewitnesses. And the gospel writers give you both. They investigated everything carefully. They have the ring of truth to them. They include embarrassing details. Another understanding among scholars? What the age does, they find the closer the manuscript to the original, less chance of error or miscopy. But McDowell explains no original copies exist of the most well-respected and accepted ancient works. When you look at Greek and Roman historians like Herodotus and Tacitus and Livy, they're, I mean, those are hundreds of years later, 500, 600, 700 years after the fact. Bible manuscripts, though, get closer to the original work than any other. We've got manuscripts and fragments that show up within 35, 40 years of the time when they were written. Why does that matter? It means there's not enough time for error in mythology to corrupt the message of what's going on there. Second, the more manuscripts you have, the easier it is to reconstruct the original. Here, the surviving ancient copies or pieces of the Bible way outnumber all others. 66,420 some manuscripts and scrolls. McDowell says second place is Homer's The Iliad with just 1,800. We do trust Homer. How much more so should we trust the New Testament documents? With so many more copies, no surprise there'd be occasional errors. And critics claim there are some 400,000 mistakes or variants in the Bible. Well, 99% of those 400,000 or so number evaporate simple spelling errors, word order. Like H-O-N-O-R, H-O-N-O-U-R. But none of those it, that texts that are in question affect any central teaching of Christian doctrine or practice. And Bach and Morrow explained to students many of the so-called contradictions in the Bible are just different ways of telling the same story. And difference does not equal contradiction, it's just difference. Doubters have a hard time believing that the Bibles we're reading today could accurately reflect the actual words written by the authors so many centuries ago. But McDowell explains how for Jewish scribes, copying books like Genesis and Exodus was holy work and strictly controlled. 4,000 regulations the scribe had to follow to guarantee accuracy. Monks had tight rules for copying as well. Another reason to trust the Bible, archaeology and related research have time and again shown the Bible's true and Bible skeptics wrong. Archaeology has probably cleared up already over half of all what appeared to be alleged discrepancies in the scriptures. Skeptics would say there's no record of a Nazareth, so the New Testament can't be true, and no record of the Hittites, so the Old Testament can't be true. 
Well, archaeology and associated research shows both existed. But now you can go to Harvard or anywhere else and study the Hittite language. Finally, there's the proof of logic. The apostles kept saying to their opponents, You know what I'm talking about. You were there. McDowell points out that's a crazy thing to do if you're making the whole thing up. They appealed to the knowledge of their opponents for the facts of which they talk about. To me, that's one of the best tests of truth historically. Bach asked what better proof the earliest disciples weren't making it all up than the fact they almost all were martyred for it. You don't die knowingly for something that you know you made up. Paul Strand, CBN News. Mm, great point. Well, Paul has much more from those Bible experts, including more examples of how modern archaeology is answering questions that have fueled Bible doubters for centuries. To see those extra interviews, go to our website at cbnnews.com. Up next, a farmer making the desert bloom with an ancient crop said to be more valuable than gold. We'll show you what it is and how he's doing it. Inside every child is a hero, a leader, a friend to others, someone who helps out, who does the right thing, who dreams of what they can be, but they still need our help. What should I do? What should I say? How should I feel? That's where Superbook comes in. It provides moral and spiritual truths through situations <laughs> children can relate to, teaching God's Word to the children you love. Join the Superbook DVD Club and receive Superbook's newest episodes as they're available, plus two copies to share with others, all for your gift of only $25. Get Superbook today and watch the miracles happen. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. And welcome back to Christian World News. Well, the Bible speaks of the bomb of Gilead. It came from a plant that was grown in ancient Israel. The bomb was used to create medicines and cosmetics. It was even used for worship in the Jewish temple. And now, as Chris Mitchell reports, a modern-day Israeli farmer is reviving that historical piece of agriculture. Meet Guy Ehrlich, visionary, farmer, and possible provider of plants needed for incense for a future third temple. This is the Balm of Gilead farm. This is the nursery. The vision was to grow the Balm of Gilead and then to make an industry out of it. Ehrlich's still in the early stages, but already he's helping turn the desert green on attractive land near the Dead Sea and Jericho. Along the years, I built a collection. Over the years, I built a collection of rare biblical and medical plants, and I understood that there are some very interesting plants in my collection that have a huge potential to benefit humanity. It started with the balsamone tree, better known as the balm of Gilead. For a thousand years, ancient Hebrew farmers in this area were the only ones known in the world to cultivate this exotic plant. They used it for medicinal and cosmetic purposes. Now Ehrlich's biotech venture is reviving that trade and more. He knew how to make out of it the most important medicine of the ancient world, a perfume that was considered to be the best perfume in the Roman Empire. It says it's the first ingredient of the incense of the Holy Temple. And since the Second Temple period, it says it was the anointing oil of the kings of Israel. At the sixth century, it disappeared from here together with the Jewish people. 
Ehrlich got his first plant from a chute that was smuggled by a German scientist out of Saudi Arabia and brought to Israel. Oddly enough, the plants he grows are thriving in the intense heat and salty soil on the shores of the Dead Sea. I believe that in the future it will become a medicine. Before it will be a medicine, it will be a nutraceutical for cosmetics. And before or after, it might serve as the first ingredient for the incense of the temple. Ehrlich has six acres of balm of Gilead trees so far, and another 5,000 plants ready to be planted. Right now, I'm the only and the biggest balm of Gilead farmer in the world. The resin from the bark, the berries, and the leaves of the balm of Gilead can all be used, and each has a different fragrance and properties. Ehrlich also grows frankincense on his plantation. This is my second baby after the Balm of Gilead. It started with the vision of bringing back the Balm of Gilead to the shores of the Dead Sea, but after a few years, I understood I have some very interesting plants on my collection, and now I have a team of plants that I want to make into products. There are more than 20 varieties of frankincense, but this is the one from the Bible, and it's considered an endangered species. This is the frankincense of the Holy Temple. There is no agriculture for this tree. This tree only grows wild in different countries in the Horn of Africa, and since there is such a demand for it, there is an overusing of the plant. Ehrlich is also growing myrrh, and there may be a connection to the gifts the Magi brought Jesus at his birth. Another way to introduce myself is as a Magi. You know, the three Magi that brought medium presents, they gave her frankincense and myrrh and gold. Now, there is a claim that the gold is the balm of Gilead, because it was more precious than gold. This is the diamond of the incense, the diamond of the medical plants. Ehrlich, who describes himself as a man of faith but not religious, is also growing a number of other plants needed to make the incense for the temple. That has caught the attention of some religious Jews who would like to see a third temple built in Jerusalem. I definitely didn't think that I was going to serve the temple, and I was surprised from the amount of temple fans that came to visit me. When Rabbi Ariel was here, I told him that I'd be more than happy to supply the incense for the temple, and I'll do my best to be ready with the incense till the temple will be here. But I told him I'm not going to build him a temple. But despite his excitement over his team of plants, Ehrlich has also had some big challenges. His plantation is in Biblical Judea, known to the world as the West Bank. And that has scared off an American company who partnered with Ehrlich for years. One reason, backlash from BDS, the anti-Israel boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. I'm sorry for this company that... I'm sorry for this company that surrendered to this wicked movement, but what can I do about it? I can only fight it by succeeding without them. He's had to dismiss his Israeli and Palestinian workers and rely on volunteers like Kanaret and her friends, who spent a week here, among other things, pulling weeds. If this is what we can do to help, this is what we can do to make uh, the, the world better at the end, so this is our job. The setback isn't stopping Ehrlich. His goal is to start a research and development center for medical plants that he hopes will benefit the area and the region. And as the Bible says, make the desert bloom. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Balm of Gilead Farm at the Dead Sea. There's a bomb in Gilead. Thanks, Chris. Well, coming up, Charles Dickens wrote one of the greatest Christmas classics ever, but did he really believe his own story? We'll tell you about the faith behind A Christmas Carol when we return. In the beginning was the Word. From CBN, the Gospel of John. Read by Pat Robertson. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son. Let the spoken word of God transform your mind and increase your faith. Receive the power of God's life-giving word. The Gospel of John. Read by Pat Robertson. Available now. Hello, I'm Terry Newsom. Did you know there are more than 148 million orphans in the world today? 148 million. But it was three little girls that taught me about the plight of orphans. Eight years ago, my husband and I spent nearly a month immersed in the daily activities of a Ukrainian orphanage as we waited to adopt three sisters. I saw firsthand the utter loneliness, the pain of rejection, 
and the overwhelming desire to be loved. That experience changed me forever. And out of it grew a ministry from my heart called Orphan's Promise. Today, we're helping orphans and vulnerable children in more than 50 countries worldwide. Thousands of children are now in safe homes. They're being educated and they're learning life skills. I'm asking you to join with me and become family to these children. Will you call the number on your screen right now? Because every child deserves a chance to be happy. When you give, smiles grow bigger. When you care, homes are happier. When you comfort, the hurt goes away. When we all come together to love, miracles happen. It's a holiday tradition for many families watching or reading Charles Dickens' classic story, A Christmas Carol. Although the work of Dickens is still widely read and studied today, few people know about his faith. Mark, excuse me, Mark Martin tells us more about what Dickens really believed. Yes, you, my good fellow. What day is today? Today? Why, it's Christmas Day, of course. Christmas Day. I haven't missed it. From the screen to the stage. The transformation of Ebenezer Scrooge from miser to cheerful giver strikes a chord in the hearts of adults and children. There goes Mr. Humbug, there goes Mr. Grimm. If they gave a prize for being mean, the winner would be him. All these versions are the result of Charles Dickens' classic novel, A Christmas Carol. The legendary 19th century English writer loved the holiday. He was even quoted as saying, I will honor Christmas in my heart and try to keep it all the year. Mankind was my business. The common welfare was my business. Charity, mercy, forbearance, and benevolence were all my business. Scholar and author Dr. Gary College has studied Dickens extensively. The Akron, Ohio native even studied in the UK, earning a PhD at the prestigious University of St. Andrews for his work on the faith of Dickens. That's what's gonna be prevalent in, in anything we read by Dickens, that idea that real Christianity, and Dickens uses that, that term real Christianity a number of times in letters and, and in his, his writing, uh, real Christianity is, is being like Jesus. During his research, College discovered that Dickens was a Christian and his faith in Jesus Christ surfaces throughout his works in the themes and characters. He read a letter for us from Dickens to one of his critics. All my strongest illustrations are derived from the New Testament. All my social abuses are shown as departures from its spirit. All my good people are humble, charitable, faithful, forgiving, over and over again, I claim them in express words as disciples of the founder of our religion. For example, in A Christmas Carol, College says Marley's warning to Scrooge about what it means to truly live life reflects the importance of imitating Christ. The taking care of humanity, the, the thinking about my fellow man, uh, doing unto others as I'd have them do unto me. Uh, for Dickens, uh, the golden rule was, was absolutely crucial. College believes the most definitive evidence for the Christian faith of Charles Dickens is this little known work written during the height of his career over a period of three years for his children. It's simply titled, The Life of Our Lord. Critics are right, it's not a fantastic piece of literature, but it is, uh, uh, it just, it shines a bright light on Dickens' faith because he is the sole editor of this thing. College calls the life of our Lord a gospel harmony, where the author interweaves the four gospels into a single narrative. In this case, Dickens summarized the life of Christ for the next generation, his children. My dear children, I'm very anxious that you should know something about the history of Jesus Christ, for everybody ought to know about him. Gospel harmonies were very important in the 19th century. A Christian family at that time would have had at least two books in their home, the Bible and a gospel harmony. The spiritual formation of his children is, is nothing that Dickens would leave to someone else. He just wouldn't have done that. 
So this would have been a very important tool in the Dickens family uh, for religious instruction, for instruction in, in, in Christian thinking. College says very few people know about this part of Dickens' work or his Christian faith. Literary critics dismissed his religion as unimportant and superficial, and educators followed suit. Even College found himself criticized when presenting his dissertation at St. Andrews. That I would be so audacious as to suggest that this icon of, of British literature uh, was somehow a man of faith. Um, I don't know how to explain that hostility other than um, people like darkness better than light. Over the years, it hasn't always been negative. A handful of literary scholars have discussed the faith of Dickens. To shine the light much brighter on the Christian beliefs of one of the greatest writers in history, College says he believes God wanted him to write this book. It's entitled God and Charles Dickens, Recovering the Christian Voice of a Classic Author, a book released this year, which is the 200th anniversary of Dickens' birth. All of that was providential and guided by our Lord. Um, it, was, it was actually rather easy to get a publisher. That's not, that's not always true. It's just a good feeling to when you, when you know the Spirit of God is involved and, and, and this is not your project. He dedicates the book to his grandchildren, writing, May you each find joy, as did Dickens in our Savior. Mark Martin, CBN News, Akron, Ohio. Thanks, Mark. Well, you can spread the Christmas cheer by sharing this story on your Facebook page. Simply find the story at CBNNews.com and post it from right there. We'll be right back. Hello, this is Pat Robertson. I've just finished recording one of the most beloved books in all the Bible, The Gospel According to John. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. My hope is that you will use this recording to allow the Word of God to abide in you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Listen to it again and again and speak the words along with me. Let these great passages fill your heart as the Word of God transforms your mind and builds your faith. Receive the power of God's life-giving Word, the Gospel of John, read by Pat Robertson, available now. May God richly bless you as you meditate on Jesus. Life, it's meant to be lived fully. Jesus said it, I came to give you life, life to the fullest. Life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your everyday. At CBN.com, we're taking what Jesus said seriously. We're here to help you discover life. Life, live it fully. CBN.com. Kids, we want them to grow up knowing God's Word. But in today's busy world, sometimes we could use some help. The free Superbook Kids Bible app has fun stuff your kids will love. They'll have a blast learning the Bible, playing great games, Did you win? watching cool videos, All right, follow me. discovering heroes in the Bible. They'll have fun while they learn God's Word. The Superbook Kids Bible app, available on iTunes and the Google Play Store. Young people, millennials, are flocking to church. It's not an exaggeration to say that we love to meet them and that we love to know their stories. Finally this week, Santa Claus is a familiar character at Christmas time, and some might not know that he's actually based on a Christian saint. Here's the backstory on jolly old Saint Nick. Christmas cookies left out for Santa, plus carrots for his reindeer. And the next morning, presents under the tree and stockings stuffed with goodies. For most Americans, this is Santa Claus. But the history and tradition surrounding the jolly old elf date back another 1,500 years. They take us to the Church of St. Nicholas in Myra, Turkey. Nicholas was born here around 280 AD. Growing up, he lived a pious life pursuing God. 
When his parents died during a plague, Nicholas was left with a huge inheritance. Instead of spending it on himself, he fed the hungry, clothed the naked, and helped those in debt to moneylenders. One of his acts of kindness gave us our tradition of hanging Christmas stockings. Legend has it that a father was about to be forced to marry off his daughters to pay his debts. Knowing the man couldn't pay the debts himself, Nicholas crept into the house while everyone was asleep and left three bags of gold. One is said to have fallen into a stocking drying by the fireplace. Nicholas was so generous with his wealth, he lived the life of a pauper and at times had nowhere to lay his head except the house of God. Seeing how much he sacrificed for others, the church elected Nicholas bishop over the region. But it wasn't an easy era for the church. One of the worst periods of Christian persecution came under the emperor Diocletian. Now, Nicholas spent years in prison, oftentimes being tortured. This was also when Constantine was fighting for control of this region and had his famous dream vision of the Cairo symbol and the words, in this sign you shall conquer. Now, when Constantine won the day, Christian persecution ended and Nicholas was free. After his release, Nicholas resumed his position and was soon considered one of the top Christian leaders in the empire. He was one of more than 300 bishops on the Council of Nicaea, which created the Nicene Creed to help unify the church. As an outspoken follower of Christ, Nicholas continued to face death threats for the rest of his life, but he never stepped away from his faith. This is the very spot where Nicholas preached. Now his life, his ministry, and his death are all kind of encapsulated in his church. He died December 6, 343, and was entombed in a sarcophagus right around the corner. Over the centuries, many traditions were associated with St. Nicholas, but it was the act of giving gifts on the anniversary of his early December death that became the most popular. In Nicholas's day, people believed that angels wrote names down in the Book of Life. That transitioned into elves keeping a record of the naughty and nice. Around the world, there are many different images of Father Christmas, from Père Noël in France to the German gift giver, Sinterklaas, who rides a donkey. Countries such as Norway and Sweden didn't have many horses or donkeys, so Nicholas got around riding a reindeer. And the eight tiny reindeer we've all heard about? Well, that was Clement Moore's creation in his 1823 poem, A Visit from St. Nick, or Twas the Night Before Christmas. And just like the belief that Jesus and the saints were returned to Earth from a celestial city, the New Jerusalem became St. Nicholas's home and workshop at the North Pole. So many of our Christmas traditions find their origins in the Bible and with this pious saint. But what can we learn from St. Nicholas? Well, for one, we need to remember that no matter how difficult our lives become, we should stay focused first on God, like Nicholas did. And of course, the most obvious lesson is that it's better to give than to receive. After all, that's the way Nicholas lived his life, based on the example set by Jesus Christ. Fascinating. Wasn't that amazing? I never knew all those things. Maybe you didn't either. Well, thanks so much for joining us this week. Until next week, from all of us here at Christian World News, have a very Merry Christmas. Goodbye and God bless. <laughs>